what is the time? We should just, it's five o'clock. Mm. We will just get started. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you for attending today. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to pay my respects to all elders um, of Gadigal Nation, but also the honor. Um, so today I want to welcome, uh, well, I want to welcome today's presenter, um, Carlos Rivera Santos. Carlos is Assistant Professor in Hispanic Studies with William and Mary, which is in Williamsburg, Virginia. He's a Latin American Caribbean cultural studies scholar, and he specializes in Indigenous studies, visual culture, and decolonial theories. Carlos was based in Queensland for over seven years, where he completed his PhD and lectured at the University of Queensland as well. Carlos joined CAKE um, in June this year as a visiting scholar, and sadly for us, he jets off in early September, mm. off to Spain. <laughs> so the title of Carlos's paper today is Indigenous Constitutional Recognition Around the World, a Decolonial Project. Thank you, Carlos, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leah. Um, so um, I just want to also acknowledge um, the Gadigal people of the Era Nation, first um, nation's owners of the land that um, the UTS is on, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. I'm a visitor that respectfully arrived to Gadigal land from the territories of the Powhatan, the Chicaomini, the Mataponi, the Monacan, the Nansimon, the Nottaway, the Pamunkey, and the Wapahannock, the first people of what today is um, called Virginia in the United States. My home is Puerto Rico, or its indigenous name, Borique. And as Caribbean and Latin American, as a Caribbean and Latin American, I affirm my Afro-Caribbean Yoruba heritage from my mom's side and my Taino Arawak indigenous heritage from my dad's side. I also want to affirm that uh, same as Gadigal peoples have convincingly stated, Indigenous peoples around the world affirm um, that sovereignty has not been ceded. We are still here. So um, thanks very much um, to, to CAKE, um, the uh, University of Technology of Sydney, okay, for taking me on as visiting fellow um, during my sabbatical um, from the university or the College of William Mary. Um, so my field is cultural studies, um, focusing on international indigenous worldviews, uh, visual culture and the colonial theories, okay? So it's a little bit of a, um, let's say, um, so this perspective is not gonna be a legal perspective or a political theory perspective, okay? It will be in the kind of, uh, within the field of indigenous studies, um, particularly international indigenous studies and cultural studies, okay? Because even the constitutions can be regarded as a text to analyze. Um, so what is my main objective that I have for with my intervention in this lecture, um, given, in the, given that it occurs in the context of Australia's referendum on the voice? My main objective is simply to provide a global context of indigenous constitutional recognition from the perspective of its links with conversation and how they become anti or even decolonial and specific examples of how this looks in countries like Canada, Bolivia, and even in the proposed constitution of Chile. Okay, so I'll be reading for the sake of time um, and I'll start with um, my, um, my slides as well. Um, just, okay, thank you. Um, but I want to start with the quote by uh, Melissa Lonco, that's in the third slide. That's okay. Third, yeah. So, Elisa Lonco, um, it's this extraordinary uh, Mapuche, indigenous, um, academic, activists and the first um, constitutional um, president of the Constitutional Assembly in Chile. We'll talk a little bit about um, her towards the end, but I wanted to start with this um, quote from her. We were first here in this territory, then 
came the state. They organized the state just from a white point of view, without the point of view of indigenous people. Colonization is a genocidal project, but we are still here. Chileans are my neighbors, but we need equal rights. So um, uh, I know that Elisa Loncon came to Australia around March 2 um, this year. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Loncon, the Mapuche, and the constitutional um, uh, proposal um, and the election of 2022 towards the end. Um, okay, so. So what, what this lecture is not, just to be clear about um, what are the expectations. Um, this lecture is not a political or legal explication of the processes of how these indigenous recognitions came about. Um, that's in the field of political um, studies or political science. It's not an historical account that aims to provide a progressive narrative of indigenous constitutional recognition where one type of recognition is better than the other, okay? And it is not an international relations account where indigenous international indigenous rights are discussed in relation to the adoption of these rights in the country in the country's policies, laws, and constitutions. Um, you can obviously deduce the position of cake. Um, but as a visitor, it would be inappropriate for me to try to persuade any person able to vote since I don't live here or have the right to vote in Australia. So uh, with that said, let's start um, full on. Um, so the year is, um, in, next one, I, oh, I'll do that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so the year is 1513. Um, over two decades after a lost Columbus and crew were saved in the Caribbean by the Lucayo Taino people, and over 250 years before the British would invade what would be later called Australia through the legal and illegitimate, illegitimate international law doctrine of Terra Nullius. The European conquistadors have already, ha have already a lot of experience unleashing the genocidal and plundering impulse um, Yet they were commanded by the Vatican and by the Vatican and then the Spanish crown. They needed to um, legally colonize the lands of the Americas. Um, the indigenous name for the Americas is Abiyayala. So as they landed, they must read what was presented here, the requirement or requerimiento by the conquistador um, Pedraria Stavila in what today is Panama. This is the first time this um, requirement, um, this legal document is read. Then it was used in many places in the Americas with different reactions from mockery to curiosity from both indigenous peoples and colonizers. It very quickly became part of the package of every colonizer endeavor where this reading of the law was followed by pure violence that asserted the authority of the kingdom in question, in this case, the kingdom of Spain. This mantra-like reading functioned as the institution of a set of normalizing spheres that needed to be pacified through pure violence and through the negative reaction of the force of law, which is an exceptional sphere where once the law is instituted, it is applied through the, sub the suspension of it in order to be able to undertake the grotesque display of colonization. And I'm not exaggerating by stating this, it reads and as it's in the, in the slide, and I'm quoting, but if you don't do this, that is submit to um, the colonizers or the conquistadores in this case, but if you don't do this and maliciously make delay in it, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall so subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and their highness. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them. And as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highness may command. And we shall take away your goods and shall do all the mischief and damage that we can as to vassals to do not obey and refuse 
to receive their Lord and resist and contradict. <clears throat> and the quote goes on. Um, it's about a two or three page document. The document is here. Um, and it was first um, approved by the Vatican and then um, the, uh, the Kingdom of Spain. Okay, crafted in 1510 and first read in 1513. The requerimiento, the requirement, was one of the first enactments using the force of law to create a state of siege in another country, kingdom, or state that would then justify a state of exception during the pacification of the given country while creating a colony. At this point, we must consider a few elements that are important to the role of colonization and indigenous peoples to the establishment of the modern state of the modern state happening much later in the end of the 17th and the 18th century. And um, first, let me see, there's, yes. So this is at the birth of international law, starting from um, that first conversation, okay? And it would be the kind of cradle for which um, the modern state would emerge. So there's a, almost an insoluble relationship between international law, state, and colonization. And this is important for um, the constitution because the constitution is pretty much the social contract between the nation and the state. And a few elements to consider um, of that time. The requirement was the first truly global document that would establish the true foundations of international law. Thus, international law is founded strongly with colonization, later establishing three legitimate, um, quotation, quote unquote, ways to colonize a country according to that international law up to the 19th century, pretty much. And the three mechanisms recognized by, indigenous, by international law to colonize a country were war, for instance, the war against the Aztec empire, treaty, for instance, the Treaty of White Angle and uh, New Zealand, and Terra Nullius. And, all, and this is the second element to consider. In all these ways, um, um, indigenous peoples were considered as res nullius. That literally translates um, null substance or no substance, usually as it relates to the politic or the body politic or the po the person as a political subject, um, any kind of rationality. So um, indigenous people were considered as res nullius um, and rendered as such, at best with a subpar citizen status and an inferior sovereignty. And regularly um, indigenous people were not considered to be political subjects. Sometimes, like in the case of Australia and Chile and other countries, constitutions explicitly stated that they should not be counted as legal subjects of the state. In the case of Australia, that happened in 1967. Um, and then, and then last um, element to consider um, that kind of this requirement for 1510 and then enacted in 1513 conversation um, kind of um, started or instituted is that these two political instances, the, the, the ones that I just mentioned, created a legal doctrine used seldomly in Euro European countries created um, by the Roman Empire, this um, legal uh, doctrine. Um, that is the legal doctrine of the state of exception to be used perpetually towards indigenous people. State of the section is the mechanism in which the state governs over a population unilaterally and outside of constitutional or any kind of law. This was in the mechanism used to enact the Jewish Holocaust, and more recently in many countries to enact um, the war against terrorism after 9-11, and today in El Salvador to invalidate civil rights to be able to, without any due process, imprison over 100,000 people allegedly associated with gangs. So um, this is um, Italian political philosopher Giorgio Agamemnon that says that states of exception, states of exceptions are less and less exceptional, actually more and more common. Okay, so um, this kind of state of exception type of 
treatment from the law and constitutions has been like um regularly used um in practice towards indigenous peoples and arguably global south peoples around the world since the institution of colonization so um for the sake of time i'm just gonna jump a few things over but um the treaties well i'll discuss treaties later but um the the, the image on the top is the treaty um that was um, used um, for First Nations. Um, and then the bottom is a fragment of the Treaty of Huachango um, in Alto Roa. So fast forward, um, basically um, almost 500 years, okay? Um, on September 13, 2007, uh, a Thursday, the United Nations adopted the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples around the globe. The effort to establish this important international legal instrument in a phrase defended Indigenous peoples' right to be different, read not everyone to be suppo to supposed to be to become westernized, was galvanized by decades of Indigenous peoples-led social movements, arguably centuries of resistance against, in a word, genocide. So pretty much this UNDRIP um, Declaration of Rights has, tries to reverse hundreds of years of that first institution of colonization predicated and practiced by a state of exception, state of exception mechanism towards mostly indigenous people. The United Nations decided to consider indigenous people's rights in the 1980s. And after an almost 700 page report was produced by Jose Martinez Lobo um, in the bottom um, on the problem of discrimination faces by indigenous peoples around the world. This international uh, indigenous peoples movement reached a dramatic plot when the UNDRIP proposal sponsored by Peru and co-sponsored by a number of Latin American and African states. Um, the declaration passed by a, an overwhelming majority of 144 states in favor 11 abstentions and four votes against it. United States, New Zealand, Canada, and guess who? Australia. Years after, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US had to reverse their positions against the declaration and acknowledge its importance. Particularly to acknowledge, in, in the words of the chairperson of the Committee for Indigenous Rights at that time, Victoria Taulu Corpus, and that's the um, person on, on the right bottom. And I'm quoting from her, indigenous peoples have rights as distinct peoples and that a constrict, constructive dialogue among all would eventually, um, would eventually lead to a better understanding of diverse worldviews and cultures. This is mainly important because as a global community and shortly after the United Nations was formed after the Second World War, the Special Committee for the Decolonization of Nations was formed in 1948 as an outcome of the recognition that self-determination was a human right. Okay, and I'm sorry that I'm like jumping through times 1513 and then uh, 2007 and then um, 1948. Mm -hmm. Basically, we agreed as a global community to reject colonialism. The ideology that countries need to colonize other countries in order to do well. And in the best of cases, continue with that ideology, the mark of a country that is doing great is that it is becoming or it becomes an empire. By the 1970s, over 100 nations asserted their right to determination, self-determination, that is their sovereignty. And this made many scholars especially speak of a post-colonial period. Um, these are some of the scholars, let me see. This is some, some other scholars. Other Latin American and Caribbean scholars, such as Lina Martin Orkov, and I have to show her because she's my mentor, um, Aníbal Quijano, um, Walter Mignolo, Maria Lugones, Nelson Malo Torres, and others, have developed the concept of coloniality. This conceptualization is trying to name the ongoing function of colonization after colonization was supposedly um, decided to be kind of considered over. 
looking for an alternative for the concept of post-colonial. This is a reaction to the call to the name um, conversation after it was supposedly ill. The fact is, as is, if one would ask that indigenous and many other global South people, if conversation was is over, the answer would be a collective hell no. So I'm going to define coloniality, but bearing in mind that coloniality is a space in which kind of, kind of um, uh, is a space where colonialism sometimes literally still operates. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna. So this is a good definition of coloniality. Coloniality is different from colonialism. Colonialism denotes a political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests in the power of another nation, which makes such nation an empire. Coloniality instead refers to a long-standing patterns of power that emerge as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, into subjective relations and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. Thus, coloniality survives colonialism. It is maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self-image of peoples, in the aspirations of self, in so many other aspects in the modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we brief coloniality all the time and every day. So this is conception of, um, I guess, a evolved form of coloniality, of, col of colonialism or colonization should be um, in mind to think about how can we, uh, to an extent, contest and reverse colonialism or coloniality um, in this case, through um, the, the mechanism of changing the constitutions of nations. So, okay. So a few ways. Um, so from a cultural and the colonial theoretical perspective, that is not a legal constitutional theory perspective, we find three types of recognition to indigenous peoples in the constitutions around the world that aims to contest coloniality as a national and global phenomenon at once. The first one, the recognition of indigenous peoples as first nations, uh, first peoples, first nation peoples. This recognition aims to reverse the colonial relationship between the state and indigenous people, where the latter are rendered as, as I mentioned, res nullius, or effectively um, not rational political beings. Second one, treaties. With legal or federal national or federal federal or nationally recognized indigenous tribes or nations, these legal agreements, while at times pre-existing the formations of sovereign national states, for instance, in the U.S. and in New Zealand or Aotearoa, establish a collective recognition of indigenous peoples, and thus um, giving um, a status of legal entities beyond the colonial individual recognition. Okay, and then the third one. Uh, okay. Is the integration of indigenous worldviews into the constitution, a sort of indigenizing of the constitution. Here, the recognition of indigenous worldviews means using indigenous philosophy and concepts to integrate indigenous points of views into crafting or recrafting of the constitution. For instance, giving legal rights to nature through the recognition of, for instance, mountains, rivers, forests as entities with legal rights, or the recognition of multiple nations into one and recasting nation states into plurinational states. The following, I'll mention at least one global example for each type, focusing on the last one because of it is the least known on Anglo-speaking countries. And so it helps us contextualize an indigenous constitutional recognition expansively to avoid an insular logic. So I'm not gonna show the faces of much indigenous peoples. Instead, I'm just gonna show artworks from the place. Um, oh, but I should say as well that I, um, um, so I'm drawing from the works of amazing scholars are doing this work um, in, in terms of making comparison with other um, ways of, in, uh, of recognizing indigenous peoples in their constitutions 
doing that work here in Australia. So, um, for instance, um, I was honored to to be a guest editor of this special issue um, entitled um, South South Dialogues: Local Approaches to Decolonial Pedagogies, in which at least two articles addressed um, a indigenous constitutional recognition in other countries, uh, such as Ecuador and Bolivia. Um, and even uh, from a legal analysis, if you're into that, um, there is a, a very um, thorough uh, legal comparative analysis of the constitution of um, indigenous peoples uh, around the world by uh, Benjamin Franklin Goosen. When he wrote that article, um, he was at University of Southern uh, Queensland. I think now he is in Deakin, but I'm not sure. So there is a lot of work to draw from, from people who are doing that work here. Um, so um, Canada, Let's start with Canada. The relationship uh, between the Canadian Crown and Indigenous Canadians evolved over 300 years of treaty formation, starting with the Namtang Treaty signed in Albany in 1701. It is there where we can discern the genesis of a later uh, constitution and recognition under the Constitution Act of 1867 um, that gives the Canadian Parliament exclusive power to make laws for the peace and order of good government of Canada. But what's important here is part two of the Constitution Act, um, the second version, which is the 1982 Constitution Act, where Canada um, recognizes uh, indigenous peoples in the constitutions in the act of 1982 as rights for of in Aboriginal peoples of Canada. So um, this should be read in the context of um, a, in North America, but basically in the Americas, people have um, used the term Indian pejoratively and as a misconception and so forth. So Aboriginal in the context of North America um, means um, of that place. So it can be translated and it has been recasted more recently in the laws as first peoples of Canada or original inhabitants of uh, Canada. So um, this act in 1982 provides the current recognition of indigenous Canadians constitutional rights. This part defines the um, First Nations peoples and recognizes in, uh, existing Aboriginal and treaty rights, including land claims agreements. The recognition of First Nations rights were driven, if only partially, by the demands of international law rather than any domestic law of Canada, which is interesting. In this regard, Canadian courts have been more responsive to Indigenous demands relative to provincial and federal governments. The recent findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, affirm the aspirational role of the United Nations instruments, such as the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in the current discourse on the relationship between the Crowns and First Nations. So, second example, um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, okay, and um, the treaty formation approach is followed in New Zealand. And this is, uh, well, I, I have a fragment of the actual treaty um, and I'm gonna read it just to um, put it in perspective as well. And this is a, a, fra a fragment of the treaty. The chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand and, um, and to the separate and independent chiefs who have not become members of the Confederation cede to her majesty to the Queen of England absolute, absolutely and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty which the said confederation of indigenous in, in individual chiefs respectively exercise or possess or may be supposed to exercise or to possess over the respective territories of the sole sovereigns thereof. And that's unquote from the, from the treaty. So even in this kind of almost um, seating there is still recognition um, of um, Maoris as a legal entity. And another interesting thing is the um, that then there's not exactly a formation of a state. So there's a direct conversation between um, 
uh, the treaty represented by uh, the, Ma the Maori Confederation and the Crown. So they can bypass technically and theoretically um, the government of um, the parliament. So um, treaty formation approach is followed by in New Zealand, the relationship between the indigenous people, the Maori and the Crown was formalized in 1840. The treaty came after the Declaration of Independence, which affirmed the political role of Maori in Aotearoa. The treaty was signed seven years after the British um, James Cook map New Zealand. The fact that New Zealand does not have a written constitution makes changes to indigenous rights under the constitution a matter of securing a simple majority in a unicam unicameral parliament. Moreover, while the recognition is made operational through a treaty-based approach, just like in Canada, in New Zealand, there's only one treaty. Um, this has allowed Maori a better position for political organization and negotiations with the Crown. The preamble of the English text of the Treaty of Waitango deems it necessary to recognize the British monarch as New Zealand's sovereign. So um, that is the, the context of um, Aotearoa. And now the um, the um, Bolivia, the plurinational republic of Bolivia. Um, so that's a piece Pachamama sort of um, uh, loosely is defined by Mother Earth, but it's a little bit more complicated. So this is a piece um, sort of suggesting the worldview where Pachamama is um, the entity that's supposedly um, like a god, but it's not really that. The most important divine entity um, for many indigenous um, groups in the Americas, um, but it's land. So the Plurinational Republic of Bolivia. The genesis of indigenous rights protection in Bolivia can be tracked back to 1991 when the Bolivian government signed the ILO Convention. The Bol Bolivian government voted in favor of the UNDRIP as well, but it was only 2009, the indigenous Bolivians were finally able to break the chains of subjugation and marginalization imposed on them for over 500 years. On 25 January 2009, the country held a referendum on a new constitution that proved to be pivotal for South America and arguably in the Americas. On the road to this constitution, the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, who is... Um, um, and Aymara, an indigenous, um, self-indigenous um, person in Bolivia, the first, arguably the first indigenous um, person to be president in, um, at least in the, in the modern history. Um, so Evo Morales, who belongs to the country's indigenous majority, the Aymara, had, a, had to make concessions as conservative opponents in the eastern lowlands, including protection from the land confiscation if they could show that their lands were productive. Nevertheless, the plurinational state of Bolivia constitution granted important self-determination to indigenous groups, including polycentric reforms, such as recognizing indigenous systems of justice along conventional courts. Further, the Bolivian constitution adopted a biocentric worldview, um, a biocentric worldview perspective, um, contrasting it against the Western anthropocentric worldview that is responsible for global issues today, I would argue, such as climate change. An anthropocentric worldview frames most human activity with the focus of human progress. So anthropos is human or man, actually. A biocentric worldview, bios is life, frames most of human activities with a focus on the well-being of the ecosystem or the world as a biological unit, like Pachamama. We can see that in every, um, in the very preamble of the constitution, okay? And um, so it's quick comparison with other um, constitutions. Um, so uh, constitution of the United States, we the people, blah, blah, blah. Constitution of Australia, where's the people of New, New, New South Wales and so forth, okay? So it starts with the people, these preambles. And obviously this um, can be seen in the very um, logic throughout the, these constitutions as well as constitutions read as text, simply as text. So in the constitution of, um, of the plurinational um, 
state of, of Republic of Bolivia, it starts in this way. And I'm going to quote from the preamble of the Constitution. In ancient times, mountains rose, rivers moved, and lakes were formed. Or Amazonia, our swamps, our highlands, and our plains and valleys were covered in greenery and flowers. We populated this sacred Mother Earth with different faces. And since that time, we have understood the plurality that exists in all things and our diversity as human beings and culture. Thus, our people were formed and we never knew racism until we were subjugated to it during the terrible times of colon colonialism. And it goes on for a couple of paragraphs, okay? And But two things that stands out. One, the first um, element that stands out uh, from the constitution is nature, okay? The biocentric approach. And secondly, there's an explicit acknowledgement of colonialism uh, and racism in the preamble. And that can be seen all, all, all throughout this constitution and the constitution of Ecuador and others. So um, this biocentric perspective very akin to many global indigenous perspectives, so many other international indigenous um, views, comes from a Suma Camaña. Um, let's see if it's, no, sorry, it's not there. Suma Camaña, um, which is Aymara in Quechua, would be Suma Causai, philosophy, which roughly, roughly translates into living well or good living. It comes from the Euha, which is a ritualized discourse of a kind of philosophical practice that is in practice, not necessarily talked. Um, so ritualized discourse or, um, or aphorism. And the aphorism is sumax kamanya hakam parlakanya hakam sarnakanya. To live well is to um, talk as beings and walk as beings. So it's um, it, 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 it frames a particular type of, um, of, um, of center of how to uh, operate and live in the world. So some common features in the way that indigenous constitutional recognition advances to a true, truer decolonial feature are, and this is discussing the three examples and more, um, of the recognition of indigenous peoples and constitutions around the world. And that includes other places, including in, um, for instance, South Africa. Um, there is a recognition of Ubuntu, a worldview perspective in the constitution. Um, so some um, elements, some features that we will think about um, that, I, that jump to the eye. Firstly, that indigenous personhood deploys a different way to relate to the territories of the political where the focus is on the nation and not so much on the state, okay? Um, so it's not necessarily the formation of government, but more about speaking um, from what people practice and how they live. Secondly, that indigenous community focus, um, there's an indigenous community focus that this centers, this centers the individualized volition of contemporary politics and recast communitarianism in the contemporary view at the level of culture, language and languages, kingship, politics, identities, and more. And this is true to all forms of indigenous recognition that I mentioned. And thirdly, in the wake of climate change and the disasters we're all facing, Indigenous perspectives offer a framework for different society organizations stemming from a biocentric perspective that would help cohesively articulate a narrative of the reality we all know we must face, yet we try to remediate at best. Incremental changes to address climate change will not work, but structuring change or framework change is prerequisite. So, I don't have really a conclusion for this talk, um, but I have um, a kind of postscript um, uh, that you can interpret as many ways, you can interpret it as a cautionary tale, but um, so I've named this part um, um, the postscript. And this small section of this talk is a postscript because 
the situation is still trying to be understood as we speak. And I mean the no result of the constitution of Chile um, voted on September 4, um, 2022, literally last year, um, which was led by the indigenous Mapuche um, as Constitutional Assembly President, Dr. Elisa Loncon, okay? On September 4, 2022, Chile went out to vote. It was compulsory for that, for a referendum to accept or reject a new constitution that would replace the constitution crafted in part unilaterally by dictator Augusto Pinochet. The proposed constitution had various elements that were like the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia and also um, of Canada, including converting Chile into a plurinational state and various in other types of in indigenous constitutional recognition, including um, their recognition as First Nations. The Constitutional Assembly was the first ever assembled in Chile before the constitutions were written by a few. The first in the world to be composed by half of the members being women and led by uh, an indigenous woman. And the first Mapuche indigenous leader, Elisa Loncon. The Constitutional Assembly started to be crafted and worked on in 2020, but arguably it was an outcome that dates back to social movements from 20, um, from 2006, including the Estallido Social. Um, I don't have a translation. The Constitution, the Constitution recognized the Mapuche, Aymara, Rapanui, Likensai, Quechua, Koya, Yagita, Cahuespa, Yagan, and others, other indigenous groups that could be recognized and, and other and leaving it open to other indigenous groups that could be recognized in the future as First Nations. And they asserted their right to speak and have their languages flourish, have collective rights, including territorial ownership, have indigenous courts of law and other indigenous constitutions, promote indigenous philosophies to be included in the education curriculum, promote indigenous health, included the UNDRIP um, as part of the constitution, gave rights to Pachamama and Mother Nature and more. And this is very important because in Bolivia, when you give rights to nature, it means that um, there needs to be a process for things like um, mining to, uh, to, uh, to mine anything. So obviously there was a lot of um, challenges right after the approval of that constitution in the case of Bolivia, mm -hmm. Um, by mining companies and other big companies, bearing in mind that it, that struggle still continues and bearing in mind that Bolivia has the, one of the largest, if not the largest source um, uh, res reserves of lithium, which is um, a very important mineral for batteries. So in the case of Chile, the vote was no by a margin of one fifth of the country, 60%. Um, the no and 40% the yes. The main reasons that have been recorded so far, and this is completely preliminary, have been that Chileans did not want to become a, pl a pl plurinational state, that non-indigenous people feared that they would lose their land and have less rights than indigenous peoples, and believe that this constitution would create a massive division between indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples. The conservative movement actively promoted this narrative, often promoting hate speech among Chileans. Among Chileans, after the no vote, the conservative party won the elections this year, so I am riding the wave. And a second constitutional convention was created with no woman and almost no indigenous representation. And for that fear that um, Chile was going to be um, divided if the constitution was approved. Actually, now for many accounts, Chile is more divided than ever after this no vote. So um, going back to Elisa, I'm a groupie, so sorry to show mm -hmm. over and over, but I want to end with um, Fanon, Franz Fanon, who is a um, uh, very important, um, anti-colonial um, activist and scholar. And um, his words are still quite relevant today. And he states, and I quote, 
The globalization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder, but it cannot come as a result of magical practices, nor a natural shock, not a friendly understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you can. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos, for a very, um, very rich presentation. Um, I'd like to see we've got some people as well on the on the Zoom. So um, unlike others here, I uh, got to read what Carlos kept telling me was a very drafty draft. Um, but Carlos, I said to you earlier, it had certainly had me reaching for Hanon on the Nolo, and I learned a little bit more about the work of Mark Rifkin. Um, so certainly for me, your paper drove home how necessary it is to know how all colonizers colonized. Mm. Um, I was struck by both uh, by the absurdity mm. of the requirement mm. that document that um, that runs to two pages, mm -hmm. and imagining the conquistadors reading it out uh, before killing people. Mm. It just it it boggles my mind. So I was struck by the absurdity of that and the longitudinal and extreme violence um, of colonization under the, under the Spanish, but also um, how later colonial powers, the British on this continent, mm. adopted and adapted you know, those strategies mm. in the way that it um, colonized and dispossessed First Nations peoples here. Um, I think the overview of the context that you gave the constitutional recognition in Canada, mm. um, Aotearoa, um, and Bolivia um, are really kind of generative grounds for, for comparison. And I wonder, uh, given how different the Spanish colonization was and what people in um, South America are working in and with, mm. and how different that is to, um, to Australia. Mm what kinds of, what we might learn um, in Australia. Um, as we talk about settler, settler colonialism much more here. So thinking about settler colonialism against coloniality um, is one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, I also, as you see, I, I don't have any questions for you yet. Okay. Um, so, and I was also thinking about the kind of the biocentric worldviews that center the well-being of the ecosystem and how, um, the ecosystem or the world as the biological unit that resonates with First Nations people worldwide, and how um, and how it's so necessary for the urgent work we all need to do around you know, addressing kind of climate change. Um, towards the end of your paper, no, what do I want to talk about here? Um, so if we if we kind of think about the voice to parliament here. And given our different histories of colonization, and here I'm thinking about Bolivia and the Blue National, the Blue National State. Um, and one of the things that, one of the comments that you make towards the end of your paper is around, um, and it's also replica, it also comes from Fanon, is the need for structural change. Mm. that And the structural change, um, Is 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 both is is likely is necessary and and for non was also always talked about that structural change of necessity needing to be violent. Mm -hmm. So there is something. How it's like how do we? I don't know how do we push past violence? Mm -hmm. Is there a way of working past violence mm -hmm. to create? Um, to create a nation, mm. perhaps not a nation state, but to create a nation of states, mm. um, of plurinational states in the way that you know, Bolivia, the world that Bolivia went from. Um, so, uh, as I said, I did reach for Manolo and I found, um, and one of the things that he talked about uh, in his, in a chapter, in his, it's his 2021 text, was around how the plurinational states um, introduce the communal into the, into the debate. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that came up for me in thinking about that was how 
Uh, and he also talks about how the plurinational can make democracy and socialism obsolete. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about that and thinking, is that, how real is that a way forward? Mm. And um, if there can be uh, an alternative to democracy and socialism, mm. how do we get to plurinational states? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the, those res that response. Leah is very generous, and um, it makes me think about many things. Um, the I think one of the things that um, I I definitely see the difference between settled colonial states and um, states that were formed in the kind of um, in the oven of colonization um, through um, a more um, what is it like explicit um, genocidal project right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I see the differences and like almost um, this machinery of colonization getting more and more um, well oiled learning from experiences um, and um and how there's there's uh, there's certainly differences. Um, for instance, that is there's this difference of like um, a lot of Latin Americans kind of um, summon, which is like in, in in Latin America or even like some parts of um, the Caribbean as well. Um, mestizaje happened, which is like the blending of culture supposedly. Um, and that's very different from like uh, mostly Anglo-Saxon type types of colonial um, processes, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of rendered as something that is um, almost positive. <laughs> um, so I see differences, um, yet also uh, particularly in the context of coloniality or these Latin American um, theorists, they're trying to acknowledge the differences of these local type of operations, but also present the narrative of a long durée type of um, history that spans from 550 years or so forth that connect mm -hmm. some threats all around uh, the formation of race mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as a, an important marker of inequality. Um, the, the emergence of capitalism through the extractivism of um, the countries that were subject to invasion and colonization. Um, so some some of those things. <clears throat> so I think both can learn from each other um, in 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 those kind of um, ways. That's why I believe in an international indigenous discourse or international indigenous um, political even project um, where because there's similarly a lot of um, threats that are similar to the worldviews of other indigenous cultures so um, so there's that you know kind of difference and repetition at once like yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but and so um, with that said, um, like the, in the context of, for instance, the constitution of Bolivia, um, there is like gains in that example, um, integrating the role views of indigenous people since the constitution, a lot of it was like radical um, elements um, into um say you know uh, property you know like no longer there's just one type of individual property there's like acknowledged constitutional right for um collective or communitarian property um or even not even property because it's not property um uh the mm -hmm. the fact that rivers lakes mountains forests have legal rights that so you can you're seeing 
and other places around the world, like in Canada yeah. and Aotearoa, where they're yeah. doing it, but through high court or Supreme Court decisions. Yeah. Um, so there is there is those those things that are really interestingly radical that were achieved um, through the through to the constitution constitution or the creation of the constitution of, of Bolivia. Uh, but there is no doesn't mean there's no critics, that there's no criticism. Um there's for instance a very um uh, important um a indigenous Aymara scholar, her name is uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, has expressed that um in the context of um of the constitution, so in the context of Bolivia being sixty one percent at a, in the beginning of a census of two thousand one, being self identifies as indigenous, um, the plurinational state could um, function as um, using a like a like a minority rhetoric, and she argues that like we were majority, like we. We are the majority of this country at one point, and now it's not understood in that way. Um, the other thing is that um, how a lot of the practices that are in the constitution, particularly large constitutions, so the constitution of Bolivia has um, about 187 pages, so very codified, very, um, wow. yeah. but it means also that. Um, there's a lot of room for um, well, uh, bypassing institutions not as strong and so forth. And many indigenous perspectives, like Liz, Rivera Cusicanqui says, like in, in a very provocative way, but I, I think she's right. Um, if you really want to make the mountain or the river um, have legal rights or become legal subjects, then when something like mining has to uh, happen or happens, you should consult them. Yeah. And there's ways to consult them. Shamans historically mm -hmm. to consult the nature. Yeah. So they, that would yeah. really have revolutionized the ways in which. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is like amazing stuff that happened in. Yeah. Um, so this. How, then how to thinking about how to practice. Yeah. The the law. Yeah. This is recognized. That's it. That's great. Exactly. Thank thank you. Uh, there is a. Um, there's a question that's come through from um, online from Heidi. She oh. says, thank you for a great presentation. Can I ask you about the live well, um, living, well yeah. living well concept? I'm keen to hear if you see this as an approach that creates space or is counter to or accommodated within colonial capitalism, modernity, anthropocentrism. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Heidi, for that question. Um, so um, it could be read from a neoliberal capitalist perspective and maybe be um, co-opted. I think um, that is um, perhaps um, something that could be read as such and even some like um, Aymara and Quechua philosophers have stated that that's a batch in translation into Suma Causay or Suma Camaña, mm -hmm. um, which um, if refer more that to a worldview that uh, and a way of being, as you say, Heidi, um, that um, makes um, or tries to establish a balance of among the living. So living well, um, or Kamanya or it, it's um, it, 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 it is often understood as something that is like I live well because uh, my surroundings live well and my community live well and et cetera, live well. So there's this kind of um, consciousness of a homostasis or a balance mm -hmm. among the living. Mm 
And to live like that is to um, think about excess, think about um, waste, mm. think about not taking more than you're giving by your literally your the being that constitutes you, such as the Pachamama. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a framework yeah. that um, it, it's its focus is about balance, coexistence, and not harming what gives you life in the first place. Yeah. Good. Thank. Thank you. Thank you. Because and I'm thinking here about how do we create, how do we create the conditions for every one and everything to live well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I see that. So. I think that's my. So is there another question? Are there any other questions? Are there questions for Carlos? Maybe I can have a look on here. Hi, are you? So there's a question from Katrina. Thanks, Katrina. Um, are law schools developing capacity among, among their students to be able to represent bio entities such as rivers, mountains, and forests? So I don't know if you can answer, have a go at that question for you. Um, are law schools the most um would be, would law schools be the first place to go for for this kind of uh thinking I, or recognition? I think um so my short answer is I don't fully know, but I know someone who knows <laughs> <laughs> very well. All right. Stay in touch, uh, Katrina. <laughs> One of those persons I showed, uh, Maria Itati Dolhare, uh, she's an expert in the legal aspects of the Constitution of Bolivia, and she did her whole PhD, and she's in UQ, University of Queensland, about um, the legal um, effects of the Constitution of Bolivia, including in the in the law schools. So. Um, from memory, um, mm -hmm. I went to her um, final thesis presentation. Um, that was at that time presented as something that needed to be worked on. Um, there needed to be some capacity building, but that was 2017. So um, I don't know, but no, I don't specifically, but I know someone who knows. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, um, Katrina. That's, um, that's the best answer we've got at the moment. And she says, thank you, very helpful. Okay, well, if there are no other questions coming through mm. from um, participants online and there are no other questions in the room, so thank you. We can. Um, we might just um, end this here yeah. for now. Thank you, Carlos, for, um, for being here and for, for giving up this presentation today. I uh, thank you, everyone who Zoomed in. Um, this is this has been recorded and I will post it somewhere, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's a... There's a few things coming in, just saying thank you. Oh, hang on, another question. Uh, thank you so much, Carlos. As change is often framed in a deficit model, do you think visual culture can contribute to reframe thinking? Good question, Helen, thanks. Um, short answer is... Yeah, <laughs> um, the um, I think visual culture particularly. So, um, for instance, um, from Mapuche worldviews, um, but also from uh, from what I know, um, traditional indigenous worldviews, um, the art and visual culture represents, or it's more it it it. Art can become a form of thinking and therefore a form of representing um, philosophies and knowledges and Recording war views. history. Exactly, yeah. and history. Yeah. Um, so, um, and one of the things that, for instance, the Chilean constitution was um, trying to put forth was, um, and that's, that's a that's a big problem, I think, in, um, for, for many indigenous nations around the world, is the, how, the question of how can we be regarded as continuing to be able to change mm 
and create new forms of culture, new worldview perspectives, even new um, new nations. Mm. That's what yeah. makes the yeah. difference between um, um, being a um, like a culture that is, um, you know, uh, dominant, I guess, and a culture that is not necessarily dominant. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I think visual yeah. culture has a huge role in creating the possibilities, um, and even the political possibilities, um, in a very expansive way, of course. Yeah. For people to be able to, you know, as cliche it might sound, but it's actually, I really mean it, creatively imagine yeah. um, other yeah. um, ways of being, ways of thinking. Because yeah. um, the, the, we know, you know, thinking of, for instance, climate change, that what we're doing is not working. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. Great question. Because it is that imagining a different future yeah 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 um and the, a question from um i'm going to jump to a question from Anne marie mm. um hi carlos you described three types of constitutional recognition how do you see the voice fitting into these or is it something different good that's question a, a good mm. question um with my limited understanding of the voice um i would um say that it is um, the first one, the recognition of indigenous peoples as first peoples, creating, and that usually, for instance, in the context of Canada, and um, that cr created um, I, um, what is it, uh, political entities mm -hmm. um, that either had the job of True family reconciliation in the context of Canada, or cre created sorry um, created um, um, other like um, government bodies that almost laterally or even um, sometimes powerfully um, provided not only input but um, not advocacy. What's the word? Um, um, thinking Spanish. Um, 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 well, yeah, I guess advocacy, yeah. like like um, looking over and making sure that um, what the main political um, body, the parliament, is doing, um, kind of the right thing, or we're seeing right. that they're doing the right thing as it relates to policy, um, as it relates to indigenous peoples. So, yeah. It's a recognition of Indigenous peoples as first peoples. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And another final question, I think, from Heidi. Um, thank you for the intro about Chile uh, constitutional referendum and the outcome. What lessons or insights might we take from the Chile experience? Um, so Because uh... one of the things you said earlier is that the no... <laughs> How strong the no vote was in yeah. the leftist movement. No, no, it was just like a section. So, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. No. Sorry, Mr. no, it was the right that promoted the 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 the, the bulk of the vote for the no. Okay. Um. So. Um, but there was some leftist support for the no position. Yeah, there was a little bit of yes. Okay. Um. So. It's still early days. Like I, I was just commenting to Leah when we uh, was meeting before this talk that um, I, I we were going at, at my university. We we're going to hire uh, an anthropologist who literally just came out to do a one or two year ethnography uh, leading up to this vote. This field is um, political anthropology, First Nations from um, from California, and he was in. Mapuche communities, um, like observing this vote. So it, it was really interesting his his work and his insights. Um, so he was embedded in Mapuche yeah, communities. Full ethnography during yeah 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 okay. during that. Yeah. So um, but that we I think we know very few things. Um, but one thing that it keeps coming up that I see 
that we can take on as a lesson, I think, is that um, the conservative movement in Chile consistently um, put forth the message that for voting, if you if um, the, the, the population voted no, um, and voted yes, they um, it would divide Chile. So uh, division of Chile because of divide Chile further than it's already divided. Yes. Well, yeah, but back then. Yeah. So because yeah. they, there would be a massive then, divide yeah. between indigenous and non-indigenous as recognized in, in the constitution. I keep hearing that as um in in um in the context of Australia. And what happened um with the no vote in Chile um, so the people who voted no, it was to not create division, but currently uh, there's very little question that Chile cannot be divided right now. Um, cannot be more divided. Cannot be yeah. more divided, exactly, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because a conservative um, um, party took over, replaced the whole um, constitutional convention with new people, as I said, mostly male, almost no indigenous representation, and there's this resentment among yeah. um, among different groups. Uh, Elisa Longo is being persecuted, basically, um, and um, it, it it's kind of reminiscent of the times of the dictatorship, where there was there was a lot of um, division among groups mm -hmm. because of the outcome of this vote. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Okay. And thank you for answering, says Anne-Marie, and for a highly informative presentation. Thank you, everyone who stayed online. Um, wish you could be here to share the fun with us. We're going to have a bit more of a bit more fun after this. Thank you, Carlos, again. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. It's uh, terrific. Mm. We're going to cut there. Mm -hmm.